Good morning and welcome to the Adult Bible Study from St. Cloud Presbyterian Church. The title of today's lesson is Attitude with Gratitude, and we're going to go to uh, the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel, look at the 11 to 19. Next week, we're going to be uh, moving over to the book of Romans, and we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Those of us who live in Western democracies enjoy a standard of living that people a few generations ago couldn't even comprehend. By one estimate, the people in the United States who live at the bottom 10% of income in the United States are in the top 30% when compared to the rest of the world. Relatively few people in this country lack basic necessities, and if they do, it can usually be traced to some bad choices they made in the past. The guy who dropped out of school has no skills, can't read or half read or write, and dresses like a circus clown, thinks that he's being discriminated against because no one will hire him. But even though there are, these are the ones that are, or they are the ones who are responsible for their situation, they still seem to think that they're being shortchanged. And liberals think that they should be hired at a minimum of $32,000 a year. Even the poorest people in this country actually live better than many people in the, uh, in, who are considered to be rich in the rest of the world. And today, most of them live a lot better than most middle class Americans did not that long ago. In spite of what politicians who are running for a re-election might say, there is no true poverty in the United States. If there were, you see people starving all over the place. The fact is, most people who are considered to be living in poverty in the United States live better than most middle class people do in Europe. If you're the average person living on welfare in the United States, your free income puts you in the top 20% for income. Did you know that there are over 600 separate assistance programs in the United States today? The average poor family in the United States has about 450 square feet of living space per person. That's 50% to 100% more than the average middle class European has in London, Paris, Munich, Rome, Vienna, and most other uh, industrialized cities in Europe. 43% of poor families in the United States actually own their own homes and they're in reasonably well uh, condition. 41% live in apartments and 10% live in manufactured homes. The average home that is owned by the family that is living below what the government says is the poverty level in America is 1,228 uh, square feet. Even though that is smaller than the national average, it's so larger than the average home in Europe, which is 976 square feet. But it still has three bedrooms, one and a half baths, a garage or carport, and a porch or patio. 80% have air conditioning. Back in the 70s, only 36% of homes in America had air conditioning, whether they were rich or poor. Almost 75% own at least one car, and 31% own two or more cars. Over 97% have a big screen color TV, cable, and a DVD player. And over half of them have two or more TVs. 89% have a microwave oven. 88% have landline phone. 35% have at least one cell phone in addition to their landline phone. And in most families, every member has a cell phone that is paid for by the government. 36% own, own a computer. 64% own a washing machine, 57% own a clothes dryer, and over 33% have a dishwasher. They are not undernourished, and of the few who are, the problem is usually because they spend the money that they have for food on things that they don't need. In fact, the biggest problem among the poor today is obesity. And in spite of what liberal Democrats say, they have access to adequate medical care. Now, don't misunderstand me. They aren't living like kings but they're living far better than most middle class people did a few generations ago. My parents never dreamed of owning the things that I just talked about. When I was young, I lived in a four room house with my grandparents that didn't even have indoor plumbing or central or a central heat. And that situation was not unusual. So poverty in America is sort of a relative term. It's more a function of lifestyle than, than it is affluence. The poor in America generally don't lack for the necessities of life, and they don't have, but they don't have money to spend to burn either. More often than not, their complaints are centered around the fact that they can't afford the luxuries that other people have. When I was finally relieved from, released from the rehab center, I had uh, hadn't been able to work in months, and I knew that I would never work again. So Teresa and I went to the local welfare office to see if we could get some sort of assistance. Well, they turned us down. 
and their advice was get a divorce but continue to live together and that way I would qualify for just about everything. But as long as we stayed married, I couldn't get help at all. Well, while we were in the waiting room, there was a young woman there, probably in her mid-twenties, who was waiting to pick up a check for something. She was dressed head to toe in designer clothes and talking on one of her two cell phones. And she was complaining to a friend that she, this was taking so long that she was going to be late for her appointment to get her hair and nails done. Then here I said, handicapped and unable to do anything. And I was turned down because I refused to get a divorce. And the reason was, I owned an old Nissan pickup truck that was worth about $1,500, and they told me that that pickup truck meant that I had too many assets to qualify. But I see other people who are getting government assistance driving around in brand new cars. That's why everyone in the world wants to come here. No other country in the world offers so much free stuff. Most countries build walls to keep their people in, but we have to build walls to keep people out. That's the lie that socialism tries to sell. It promises that the government will take care of you, but the only people who are actually taken care of in that system are the ones in charge of the system. Socialism promises equality, but the, the reality is everyone but the, uh, everyone but the leader equally miserable. If socialism was such a great idea, then why are all these immigrants why aren't they all these immigrants heading for Venezuela? Why do they all want to come here? Did you know that Venezuela used to have the second richest economy in the Western Hemisphere? They were second only to the United States. But then they voted in a socialist named Hugo Chavez. And as a result of his socialist policies, the people have been reduced to eating their own pets and searching through their town dumps to find enough food to stay alive. But Chavez and his cronies lived like kings. When Chavez died, his hand-picked successor was a man named Nicolas Maduro. Well, after he finished Chavez's term, they held an election and Maduro won. But it was discovered that the voting machines that were used had been designed to throw out votes of his opponent and only count votes for Maduro. And guess what? Those voting machines came from the same company that supplied voting machines to 30 states in the 2020 election. And many of them were found to be doing the same thing. So Maduro had actually been voted out of office. That meant that Juan Guaido was to be the next president, but Maduro refused to leave office. And the controversy continues as Venezuelans suffer. Now, with everything that America has to offer to its citizens, you'd think that the people would be happy and content, but most of the, and most of them are. But there is a very small number of very vocal socialists in America today who seem to feel that America is a terrible place to live. But I defy them to find in other places better. The only reason for this anti-American attitude is that these people want to be in charge. And if they gain power, all the bad things connected with socialism won't affect them. Two years ago, a Florida TV station reported on Angel Adams, who was the uh, mother of 15 children. She was complaining about the lack of help from social services. Seems as she was receiving assistance, and her living boyfriend and the father of 10 of her children, Gary Brown Sr., was also providing some support. But after the father was arrested and went to jail, she was evicted from her apartment and ended up in a motel room with 12 of her children. The other three were old enough to support themselves. Now, the obvious question is, why did she have 15 children if she couldn't afford to care for them? And the answer is really quite simple. For every child she had, her welfare check went up. And here's what she said to this reporter. Somebody needs to pay. Somebody needs to be held accountable. They need to pay. Well, to me, the one that needs to be held accountable is her. The woman had no concept of personal responsibility. Nobody forced her to have all those children. They were her children but she expected someone else to take care of them. Well, that video was posted on the internet and it went viral. It chalked up 180,000 views on the first day. And as you might expect, this woman's attitude created a firestorm of criticism. And she also got a lot of sympathy from people who offered various reasons why she was justified in feeling that she was being treated unfairly. But the vast majority of people who responded felt that she was being ungrateful for the assistance that other people was providing for her and her kids. The author Stephen uh, Mariboli 
observed that the more I understand the mind and the human experience, the more I begin to suspect that there is no such thing as unhappiness, there is only ungratefulness. Benjamin Franklin had this to say about how the government should handle poverty in America. I am for doing good to the poor, but I think the best way of doing good for the poor is to not make them easy in their poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. I observed that the more public provision were made for the poor, the less they provided for themselves and, of course, became poorer. And on the contrary, the less was done for them, the more they did for themselves and became richer. We can see this uh, very clearly in all the people today who won't go back to work because after the federal government kicked in an extra $300 a month in unemployment, they were making more money staying home than they were making when they were working. So they just sit at home and collect their check. I told Teresa that this attitude was going to come back and bite them. When their jobs opened up again after the pandemic eased up, they refused to return to work. Well, the extra unemployment money that they were getting wasn't going to last forever. And when it was stopped, they found themselves without a job, and their old job was no longer available. Well, do you think that Marabali was right, and the happiest people in the world are usually the most ungrateful people in the world? Or the most people in this country show no gratitude at all for what they have. Instead, they're unhappy because of the things that they don't have. And the reason you don't hear more people complaining about the downturn in the economy is because Biden is making them comfortable in their poverty. They're all eating. They can still drive their cars, chat on their cell phones, and watch their big screen TVs. So why should they go to work when the government is paying them to stay home? The religious heritage of ancient Israel linked happiness with thanksgiving. So joy, praise, and gratitude are all interconnected. Read in the Psalms, I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng I will praise you. And I will praise the name of God with a song, I will magnify him with thanksgiving. And let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. I mean, I could go on, but I think you get the point. Our worship should include rejoicing and giving thanks. A very familiar verse from Psalm 118 centers on thankfulness. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. There isn't a lot of difference between praising God and thanking God, and they both should be at the heart of worship. Even so, the Bible tells us about a lot of ungrateful people the story of the Exodus should have been filled with celebrations of a, and a quick march to the Promised Land, but instead all the people did was grumble and gripe, and the journey was anything but a celebration of freedom. No matter what a person may have, an ungrateful heart will always want more, and greediness will always nullify gratefulness. Even so, God has still graces to the ungrateful and the wicked, well, in today's lesson, we're going to look at a um, mighty act of kindness that was bestowed on ten very desperate men, but only one of them exhibited gratefulness. As we look at this story, we need to evaluate our own hearts to see if we're the, displaying greed or gratefulness. Okay, so let's go to Luke's Gospel and uh, look beginning at verse 11 of chapter 17. In this section of Luke's Gospel, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. He actually began moving toward Jerusalem back in chapter 9, verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Well, he won't arrive there for the final time until chapter 19. In this passage, we find ourselves in the final few months of Jesus' life here on earth. The time is drawing near for his death and resurrection, but he isn't going directly to Jerusalem. For the last few months, he's been crisscrossing the area around Jerusalem, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, as well as healing people, casting out demons, and doing many other miracles. He also has been speaking about the hell and judgment and trying to wake the people up to the fact that he is their Savior and uh, Redeemer. He has also spent a lot of time teaching his disciples, as well as confronting the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. So during these last few months, Jesus has performed many miracles, and Luke records five miracles for us. But there aren't, these aren't the only five miracles that Jesus performed. During the time that Jesus was here on earth, he practically banished disease from Israel. There was no way to even calculate the number of miracles he performed, much less record them. In fact, John wrote, now there are many other things that Jesus did, 
for every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written. But we do see the record of five of the miracles that Jesus performed during this time of, in his ministry. And the one we're going to look at today is miracle number four. The first three miracles involved one person each. And the last one took place in Jericho where Jesus healed two blind men. Uh, Luke's account focuses on one of them and Matthew fills in the details about the second one. Well, the miracle that we're going to look at today involves 10 men, <clears throat> and these 10 men were aff afflicted with the most terrible disease known at that time, leprosy. Today, it's known as Hansen's disease. Well, the life of a leper wasn't easy. We read in Leviticus, the leprous person who has a disease shall wear torn clothes and let his hair on his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he is, has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Okay, let's pick up our story in verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, and as he entered a village, he was met by two, ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests, and as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Here we have an amazing miracle. Ten men were simultaneously healed on the of the most dreaded disease of that day. This is a demonstration of Jesus' divine power that is unmistakable and undeniable. In that day there was no cure for leprosy. But Jesus just cured ten lepers with a word and he didn't even need to go near them. Only God could do that. Now just as a footnote here, the Jewish leaders who hated Jesus with a passion never denied Jesus' power to perform miracles. After all, there was no way that they could. There were just too many eyewitnesses. They also never denied Jesus' compassion and sympathy toward people who were suffering. God was demonstrating his compassion just as much as his power because the miracles that Jesus did were miracles of mercy that were shown to, uh, to people who were suffering. Well, of all the people who were to be uh, avoided, lepers topped the list. It's obvious that these people really had leprosy and not some other disease because verse 12 says that they stood at a distance. And Jesus demonstrated compassion, sympathy, and power by undoing what the people of that day would have considered to be a divine curse. See, the people of that day felt the disease came as a punishment for sin. So no one was interested in helping a sick person because they felt that they were getting what they deserved. And since leprosy was such a horrible disease, they figured that whoever had it must have done something really terrible. So here we have Jesus. And he's showing compassion and sympathy toward these men, as well as demonstrating his divine power by overturning what the people saw as a divine judgment against these people. So no matter how you look at it, Jesus performed a stunning miracle. Now when Jesus healed a leper back in chapter 5, he told him not to tell anybody about it. You see, it was such a stunning thing to heal a leper that Jesus was afraid that if the news got out, it would create such an overwhelming enthusiasm and unrealistic messianic expectations that he would be forced off of his father's timetable. But in this case, his crucifixion was so near that it really didn't matter. Okay, so exactly what is leprosy? Well, the Greek word in verse 12 is translated lepers is lepros, and it simply means scaly. So lepros was a word that was used to describe a lot of skin diseases, and they were, could range all the way from a not-so-serious to the life-threatening kind. Well, one of the worst kinds is caused by a bacteria, and we call it leprosy. And if you uh, like, it's Hansen's disease. This disease is so contagious that the Old Testament lays out uh, very specific ways to treat people who had it. Leprosy is a very ancient disease. Medical historians feel that it originated in Egypt because it has been found in ancient mummies. So it goes way, way back. Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 lay out a careful plan for determining whether someone has the disease or not. And the local health inspectors were the priests. This was part of what they did. 
So they were the ones who were responsible to know and apply the law of God. And since this was laid out in the law of God, if you had any kind of skin disorder, you went to the priest for a diagnosis and you went through the process that God had laid out for leprosy in, in Leviticus. That way, they could determine exactly what you had. Well, it was discovered to be, if it was discovered to be leprosy, you were then removed from all contact with other people. The only other people that you could associate with were other lepers. And this was the worst thing that could happen to a person. You were cut off from your family and friends, and these were people that you needed the most. Well, as a leper, if you happened to encounter someone who wasn't a leper, you had to stand off at a distance and warn them by waving your arms in the air and yelling, unclean, unclean. And if that wasn't bad enough, everyone assumed that you had done something so bad that God was punishing you by making you a leper. So lepers were probably the most miserable people on earth. I mean, they were cursed by people, and they believed that they had been cursed by God. Well, they had a good reason to think that way. I mean, after all, God had used leprosy as a punishment in the past. He punished his Naaman for le with leprosy. He punished King Uzziah with leprosy. So to be a leper was horrible. Lepers were totally cut off from society. They were religiously and socially disheiled in every way. No family, no job, no friends, no worship, and no hope. I mean, if their family and friends didn't bring food to them, they'd starve to death. They were walking illustrations of what sin does to a person and God's judgment of it. It was a horrible way to live. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that when Jesus came to this village, these ten lepers cried out to him. And from the Jewish viewpoint of the day, for Jesus to come by and heal these men was pretty amazing. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about the disease of leprosy. Today, leprosy is known as Hansen's disease. It's named after a Norwegian epidemiologist named Gerhard Henrik Aramier Hansen. In 1873, he's the one that discovered the bacteria that caused leprosy. Well, leprosy has not been eradicated. There are about 6,500 known cases of leprosy in the United States today, and 3,300 of them require ongoing medical treatment, and there is still no known cure. But it's not quite as communicable as they once thought it was, and modern medicine has developed very effective treatments for it. Leprosy attacks the nerves and the skin. It causes a person to lose all feeling uh, in their body. So the potential for serious injury is greatly increased because the body's warning system has been turned off. The first sign of this disease were white uh, to pink patches that show up on the brow, the nose, the ear, the cheek, the chin, and the head. This patch will be, uh, then start to spread in all directions from there. A uh, portion of the eyebrows disappear. Spongy tumors start to appear all over the face, and then they begin to spread from there. The skin loses its color and becomes very thick and glossy. As the disease progresses, these thickening spots become dirty sores and ulcers due to the poor blood supply. In its later stages, it starts to affect the internal organs. Fingers and toes can be absorbed into the body because the bacteria starts to invade the bone marrow. This is what impedes the normal blood flow and causes the bones as well as the rest of the body to shrivel. And as the issues in the extremities, as the issues in these uh, tissues in these extremities die, they turn black and gangrene is a problem. Since the victim has no feeling, they will also start to destroy themselves. For years, it was thought that the disease caused the ulcers on the hands and feet that would lead to rotting flesh and the eventual loss of arms and legs. Well, thanks to research done by a doctor in India named Paul Brand, we now know that most of these ulcers were caused uh, because the people can't feel what they are doing to harm themselves. So people basically are destroying themselves. Lepers in Africa have been known to reach into a fire to retrieve a piece of food. There's nothing here to tell them not to do it. Patients in Brand's hospital will work all day gripping a tool with a nail sticking in their hand, and they don't even know it. On one occasion, Dr. Brand was trying to open the door of an old storage shed, but the rusty old padlock wouldn't budge. Well, an undernourished 10-year-old boy came over and offered to help. With one quick jerk of his hand, the lock was open. Dr. Brand wondered how the small undernourished boy could open that lock when he couldn't. But when he noticed a drop of blood on the floor, he had the answer. Brand discovered that the act of turning that key had cut the boy's finger all the way to the bone, and he didn't even feel it. He wasn't even aware of it and left untreated, infection would have set in and the finger would have been lost. 
So the daily routine of life grinds away at the hands and feet of these lepers, and he, and he has no warning system to tell him that he has injured himself. If a rat nibbles off a finger during the night, the leper won't even know it until the next morning when he knows his finger's gone. Stanley Stein had leprosy, and he, was, uh, he would wash his face every morning with a washcloth that had been dipped in boiling water. But neither his hands nor his face had enough feeling in them to warn him that he was injuring himself, and he eventually destroyed his eyes and went blind. It also penetrates the teeth and causes them to fall out, and it affects the larynx, and the voice gets very weak and raspy. Now, for all your trivia buffs out there, armadillos are the only animal known to exist that can carry the bacteria that causes leprosy, and they seem to be naturally infected with it. But it doesn't affect them at all, and no one knows why. But scientists are trying to find out. Well, even though this bacteria doesn't seem to affect armadillos, that doesn't mean that they can't pass it on to humans, and they do. In fact, there are 12 cases of leprosy reported in Central Florida in 2015, and two of them had been infected with leprosy after coming in contact with an armadillo. Last year, one Central Florida man went to his doctor with a mysterious skin rash that he couldn't identify. That is, until he had learned that 30 years earlier he had worked as an armadillo hunter. That led to the diagnosis of leprosy. And 30 years have passed since he had been, expect, uh, had been exposed to an armadillo. There are currently about 6,500 patients in the United States who are currently being treated for leprosy, and about 200 to 250 new cases are reported every year. About 90% of them are illegal immigrants, immigrants, mostly from Mexico, and Joe Biden is currently sending them all over the country. So even though the chances of catching leprosy from an armadillo are very slim, my advice is stay away from armadillos. Now I'm going to do a little editorializing here. There are people in parts of the world who eat armadillos. In fact, there are a few right here in Osceola County. I knew a man in Poinciana who liked to kill and eat them. Now, I can't back this up, but my guess is the, the cases where people caught leprosy from an armadillo were seen among the people who were eating them. So, even though your chances of catching leprosy are very slim, it is still a very contagious disease. It can be transmitted by inhalation, body contact, and even contact with clothing that has been worn by a leper. That's why clothing was involved in the procedures that God laid out in Leviticus. In biblical times, the disease was so severe that it had the potential to wipe out whole towns. An effective treatment for leprosy wasn't developed until 1982. So there are about 2 million new cases around the world every year in areas that still do not have the means to treat this disease. All right, so why am I telling you all this? Well, I, I'm hoping that as we look at this story, you'll have a better understanding of how this is an amazing story of divine goodness, passion, and mercy. It's also an amazing story of divine power. Jesus brought this terrible disease to a screeching halt and restored these ten men to full health, which is the case with every miracle he performed. If he healed someone with blindness and the person had a toothache as well, Jesus didn't send him away with a toothache. He would heal everything that was wrong with him. Jesus' miracles were instantaneous and complete. This is also an amazing story of ingratitude, but at the same time, it's also an amazing story of gratitude, worship, and salvation. So this account is much more than simply the record of an event in the life of Jesus. It's a story, it's sort of like a parable, but technically it's not a parable. Most of the parables that Jesus told were stories that he made up. But lots of things that actually occurred in his life were also wonderful illustrations, and this is certainly one of those cases. All right, look back at verse 11. This event happened as Jesus is moving toward his final visit to Jerusalem, and as he's moving around the area, he did visit Jerusalem three times, but those visits were not the last time that he would go there. The final time was when he would go there at Passover and die as the sacrificial lamb of God. But he did go there for a short time to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles as well as the Feast of Dedication, which is Hanukkah. And while he was there, the Jewish leaders tried to stone him. Well, he also came within a few miles of Jerusalem a third time. That's when he went to Bethany and, uh, to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. Well, John tells us that after he raised Lazarus, he went north. He, he knew that doing such a powerful miracle so close to Jerusalem would definitely attract the attention of the Jewish leaders. 
And since it wasn't very long ago that they had tried to kill him, he wasn't going to allow anything to get him off of God's timetable. See, he wasn't supposed to die until Passover. So he went to a place called Ephraim. Well, Ephraim happened to be in the area between Samaria and Galilee that's mentioned in verse 11. So it's very possible that this is where he was when, he, when this uh, event happened. He would eventually end up in Galilee, and then he would make his final trek to Jerusalem from there. Look at verse 12. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. We don't know if Ephraim is a village mentioned in verse 12, but if it wasn't, it was certainly uh, in the same area. And as he entered this village, he encounters ten lepers. They don't dare get close to him. And the fact that they kept their distance tells us that they had definitely been diagnosed with leprosy and not some other skin disease that would fall into the category of skin diseases called leprosin. So as Jesus draws near to the village, these ten lepers start yelling to him from a distance, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. But they didn't dare come any closer than they thought they could get away with, because if they did, the people would have stoned them. Now, it's interesting that they called Jesus Master. Of all the words that they could have chosen, they chose to call him Master. In Greek, it's the word epistates. Luke is the only, the only one who uses this word, and the only people who ever used it to refer to Christ were his followers. It's a word that carries some weight. It speaks of someone who has a very notable authority and power. And that's why it's used here to refer to Jesus. <clears throat> the fact that they use that, this word to call out to Jesus indicates that at least at some point in the past, these men have been exposed to Jesus' great power and abilities. At the very least, they knew his reputation. Apparently, he had heard, they had heard about all the people that he had healed, and I'm sure that many of them were lepers. So these men saw Jesus as their only hope. There was no cure for the disease. So there was the only chance, uh, he was the only chance they had to be healed. Their faith may have been meager, but it was, it was desperate. After all, what other option did they have? So they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That phrase recognizes the fact that they have a problem that they couldn't solve on their own. They know that their only hope is to appeal to a superior power, and that's why they ask for mercy. They're saying, have pity on me, you are more powerful than I am. Apparently these men knew that Jesus is someone who listens to people like them, so they feel free to approach him. Look at verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priests. You have to wonder why he didn't pull a Benny Hinn, stretch out his arm and say, be hailed. But he didn't. In fact, he didn't even go near them. Instead, he just told them to go and show themselves to the priest. Well, he's doing a couple of things here. First, he's testing their faith. They may not have had great faith, but they had. this was a good test. Do they have enough faith to do as he says? After all, they should, uh, why should they go to the priest? They still have leprosy. Jesus is also affirming the viability of divine law. He knew the procedures that had been laid out in the book of Leviticus, and he's going to abide by them. So he tells them to go and show themselves to the priests. And as he, he had also told the leper that he had healed back in chapter 5 to do the same thing, because that's what the leprosy requires you to do. You had to go to the priest. Well, there was a rather lengthy procedure that these had to follow before a leper could be declared free of leprosy. Like I said earlier, the priests were the health inspectors of the day, so you went to the priests. And they would test you to see if you were truly healed, and it was an eight-day process. Well, after the eight days, if the priests weren't sure that you were healed, you may have to go through the process all over again. So this was a big test of their faith. These men hadn't actually been healed yet. And if you still had leprosy, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near a priest because you'd be going to the health inspectors with your disease. It was also dangerous for a leper to get too close to anyone because they could be stoned to death for doing it. For a leper to approach someone was the same as threatening them with a deadly weapon. So they tended to stay together in leper colonies, and they would very rarely venture out on their own. But Jesus tells them to go and see the priests in order to fulfill the requirements of the law, and they did it. That's what desperation will do to you. They were willing to risk being stoned to death if it meant being healed. So they, did these men have faith? Yes. Was it great faith? No. But it was sufficient for them to be healed. 
They had faith in the power and the compassion of Jesus. And verse 14 says, And they went, as they went, they were cleansed. Now there is one thing to this story that I am always amazed by. Every time we read about a miracle that Jesus performed, it's always understated. If the gospel writers were making this stuff up, you would expect to read about how the sky turned dark and thunder rumbled and the angels sang as Jesus lifted his arms and pronounced these men healed. But you don't see any of the, anything like that here. There's no hoopla and no fanfare. He doesn't swing his coat in the air and people fall on the, uh, down on the ground. They just started walking toward the temple and as they were he and they were healed somewhere along the way. It's just another day in the life of God. Now, these men didn't think that it was odd for Jesus to tell them to go see the priest. I mean, these men knew that they would have to have their healing verified. Leviticus even tells them what they need to do after the healing is verified. They were ceremonies, symbolic washings, and sacrifices that needed to be done. It's quite an involved process. So Jesus sends these men to the priest to have their healing verified, and even though they didn't really uh, had been healed yet, they go anyway. Now, there is a really great irony here. So never tell me that God does not have a sense of humor. These priests rejected Christ. A few of them believed, and, but most of them rejected him. And here come these ten lepers, and these priests are forced to validate the fact that Jesus had just healed them. So they're going to become the very reluctant witnesses of the power and compassion of Christ. They're going to become eyewitnesses of the fact that Jesus had overruled any assumption that they may have had about how these lepers were cursed by God. In other words, these priests are going to be forced to confirm the supernatural power of Christ because if these men were in fact truly cursed by God, then God was the only one who could have lifted the curse. And since Jesus lifted the curse, he must be God, right? So if they were honest, they would have, uh, have to verify his deity as well because Jesus was doing things that only God could do. So these priests were reluctant witnesses of the deity of Jesus, and this is why the Jewish authorities could never deny the miracles that Jesus performed. Think about it. Jesus had healed so many lepers that they were probably standing in line to go through the eight-day process to confirm their healing. And once the process was complete, the priest had to publicly announce that these people had been healed of their leprosy. Can you imagine how humiliating that must have been for these priests? So these men had faith in Jesus' reputation as a healer. In other words, they believed that he had the power to heal them. And as thin as their faith was, it was enough to heal them. And they did what Jesus said because they really didn't have any other option. <clears throat> and as they were walking down the road, they were healed. So were they healed because they believed? Well, they did have some faith. But they were really healed simply because Jesus had chosen to heal them. There was nothing in them that would make them worthy of what Jesus had done for them. Even so, as meager as their faith was, he still made it them demonstrated. There were times when Jesus healed people because they believed, and there were times when he healed people who didn't believe. I mean, after all, he raised people from the dead, and there was no way a dead person could demonstrate their faith. So there were times when faith played a role, and there were times when it didn't. But in this case... Jesus asked these men to demonstrate that they had enough faith to do what he told them to do. Now this miracle is amazing. And there were lots of people standing there who saw it. But can you imagine the reaction these ten men would have looked at each other and realized that they had been healed all at the same time? I mean, they were stunned. Verse 14 says that they were cleansed. The Greek word is katharizo. We get our word catharsis from that word. It refers to something that has been made pure. Their leprosy didn't go away over time. It was completely gone. Not a trace of it was left. They all started out toward the priest together. <clears throat> they were all healed together. But at that point, they, their commonality of their healing was broken. Look at verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Ten men were healed. When they realized that they had been healed, one of them turned back from going to the priest. When this man realized the significance of what had happened to him, he spun around, he came running back to Jesus and loudly praising God. He realized that he would now be able to go back to his family and friends, and even more than that, he realized that he was in the presence of God. After all, God was the only one who could have done this. 
Remember, people at that time thought that lepers had been cursed by God, so God was the only one who would lift the curse. That meant that at the very least, Jesus has to be in touch with God. And this man wanted more than physical healing, so he went back to Jesus seeking what he knew he really needed. His heart was longing for a relationship with a divine healer, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This is another way that we know that Jesus is God. This man worshipped him. And you only worship God. Well, Jesus didn't tell him to stop. This man knew enough about the Old Testament to know that God was much more than just a healer. He was a redeemer as well. And he understands the reality of his alienation from God as well as the need for reconciliation with God. So this man comes back and he does three things. First, he praises God with a loud voice. Loud voice translates the Greek word megasphone. Uh, his voice is now a megaphone. <clears throat> was no longer weak and raspy. So he goes back praising God at the top of his lungs. When he gets to Jesus, he falls on his face at his feet and worships him. He knew that God was the only one to be worshipped, and this man acknowledged the deity of Christ. Third, as a part of his worship, he gives thanks. He is grateful for all that Jesus has done for him. This man knew that he was in the presence of God, and he couldn't hold back his praise. He felt compelled to worship and his gratitude is just pouring out of his heart. He couldn't restrain it. He says to Jesus, I want a relationship with you. I want all that you have to offer. Well, here's an interesting way to see this. What are the other nine guys doing? They're so headed toward the priest. They're thinking, we're going to the temple because that's where you have to go to offer that required sacrifices. And I'm sure that when we get there, we'll be grateful. We'll worship God when we get there. After all, that's where you go to worship God, right? Well, worship and praising God when we get there to the place where God dwells. Well, guess what? God doesn't dwell in the temple. In fact, God abandoned the temple a long time ago. This was an apostate temple that promoted an apostate religion. Jesus said this to the Samaritan woman that he met at the well. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. You see, you don't have to be in a particular place to worship God anymore. As long as you worship Him in spirit and truth, you can worship Him wherever you happen to be. And most of all, this man knew where God dwelt. God dwelt wherever Jesus was. Jesus is the real temple. And when Jesus is in your heart, He is dwelling in you. Wherever the grace of God is, wherever the compassion of God is, wherever the power of God is, that is where God dwells. And this man knows that God offers more than just physical healing, and that isn't the real issue in his life. That's only a temporary issue. So, not only does he return to Jesus to thank him for his healing, he returns to him seeking what he knows his soul needs, and that is salvation. After all, he thought that he was, his leprosy and, uh, had been given to him in the first place because of his sin. So he wants to make sure that his sin has been forgiven. How do we know that? I know it because that is exactly what Jesus gave him. Here's the real kicker. The man is a Samaritan. The Samaritans started out as apostate Jews who had intermarried with Gentiles, so the Jews felt that they were, had polluted their race and were defiled. They also practiced a hybrid sort of Judaism that the Jews despised. So from a Jewish point of view, this man was the least likely to receive anything from God. The only reason that he was hanging out with Jews in the first place was they all happened to be lepers. The fact that they all shared a common misery is what brought them together. And not only had God healed this man, he gave him salvation. And by the way, the first person on earth that Jesus openly revealed his messiahship to was a Samaritan woman that he met at a well. So this man knows that Jesus isn't like the people that he used to hang out with. God is not a racist. And he knows that God is a savior and a redeemer. So he comes back and he worships Jesus. Well, at this point, Jesus turns to the crowd that has been watching all of this, and he asks three rhetorical questions. First, were not ten cleansed? And everyone standing there knew that there were ten of them, and the answer is yes. Question two is, where are the nine? They certainly ought to be there, right? But they're still marching down the road to see the priest. They got what they wanted from Jesus, and they didn't think they needed him anymore. 
They have no desire to even say thank you, much less worship him. You see, they don't see him as God. So they don't, have, they don't give him what God deserves. They don't fall down and worship him. They don't praise him. They don't thank him. These men are demonstrating the same uh, dominant attitude that Jesus has encountered from the Jews throughout his ministry. We are God's chosen people. God gave us what we deserve. Our souls are fine. See, they had no sense of sin. They were like the rich young ruler in chapter 18. There was no sense of remorse over their sin. There is no repentance. There is no sense of desperation. They weren't looking for a Savior who would remove their sins. They didn't think that they had any sins that needed to be removed. You see, they weren't looking for a Messiah who would save their souls. They were looking for a political and a military Messiah. That was, they were looking for a Bernie Sanders who wanted someone to give them free stuff. They were looking for someone who would heal them and then leave them alone. And they felt that they deserved to be healed because they were God's chosen people. They'll accept that sort of Messiah, but they won't, don't want anything else. We have a lot of people standing in pulpits every week who are offering that sort of Messiah. Come to Jesus and all your troubles are over. Just say that you love Jesus, believe that he'll give you what you want, and bam, you got it. But this one man knew that he needed a Savior. He knew that he had come face to face with God. His soul was traumatized. He knew that he was a sinner, but he also knew that God had shown him mercy by healing his leprosy. So this outcast Samaritan returned to seek what he knew that he really needed, and that was salvation. And he didn't ask Jesus for anything else. You know, Jesus really doesn't have anything to offer you that's permanent except salvation and eternal life. If you don't come to him for that, then you've cheated yourself out of what he, uh, uh, he came to earth to offer. The third rhetorical question is, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? No one came back except this one man. And he wasn't even a Jew. He was a Samaritan. And that would gall these Jews. The word foreigner translates the Greek word alogenes. It's a very strong word. That word was printed on the outer wall of the temple. It was there to keep anyone who wanted to, who wasn't a Jew from entering the temple grounds. The total uh, on the sign said any foreigner who goes beyond this point is responsible for his ensuing death. There was a court of the Gentiles, and that was as far as they could go. So foreigners were, th were those who were outside of the covenant. They weren't included among God's people, and that's a real shock. This man is a hated Samaritan. He's of another race. He's a foreigner. He is not allowed into the presence of God. But instead, he walked right up to God himself and enters into his Holy of Holies and the feet of Jesus, and Jesus welcomes him. This man couldn't get into the inner court, let alone into the holy place or the holy of holies of the temple. But he walked right into the real holy of holies, fell at the feet of the Holy One himself, and worshipped him in humility and joy, while the rest of these men walked away with their dead, blind, stone-cold religion. They had no desire at all to know Jesus. They got what they wanted from him, and they didn't need him anymore. Well, this, this story comes to a glorious conclusion in verse 19. He, he said to him, Rise! and go your way, your faith has made you well. In other words, go ahead and go to the priest and let them verify that you've been healed. I've already taken care of your salvation. After all, his faith, a faith that's different than the faith that the rest of those guys demonstrated, has made him whole. Now, the English translation can be a little bit misleading here. Many translations say, he made you well, he healed you, he made you whole, or some other similar language. But that's not really what it means. I mean, after all, all ten of those men have been made well, so they can't be what distinguishes this man as being different from them. The word that is translated well in verse 19 is not the same word that was translated healed in verse 15. In verse 15, it's ia'amahi. It's also not the word translated cleanse that we see in verse 14. That was katharizo. The word translated well in verse 19 is sozo. It's the word for deliverance and salvation, and that's how it's used most often. There are some contexts where it can be used to describe something less than salvation, but this isn't one of them. It's obvious that this man had to return to Jesus penitently, worshipfully, and Jesus healed his soul and gave him salvation. And this was a second miracle that was unique for this man. So I have no idea why the translators decided to use it this way. 
Back in chapter 7, Jesus told the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's the same word, sozo. And Young's literal translation shows it as your faith has saved you. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Well, I'm glad you asked. The man had demonstrated trust, gratitude, humility, commitment, love, praise, and worship. These are all components of a faith that went far beyond the faith that the other nine men demonstrated. It's a faith that embraces Jesus as God. It's a faith that accepts Jesus as their Lord. It's a faith that bows humbly, humbly in recognition of one's lowliness in his presence. And it's a faith that Jesus says will save someone. But this isn't a story that simply tells about what happened to this one individual. It's really an allegory that has a deeper meaning. The nine who didn't return show us the general attitude that most Jews of that day had toward Jesus. Give us healing, give us food, deliver us from demons, do miracles, but don't expect us to worship you. Don't expect any praise, adoration, or thanks. Don't expect us to acknowledge you as God. But the man who returned fell down glorifying God. He knew that at the very least that God was in touch with Jesus, but I'm not so sure that he realized that Jesus was God. His theology wasn't fully developed yet. But then he worshipped, and he knew that all worship belonged to God. He also knew that God was the source of his healing, so he returned to thank and worship Jesus. In other words, he returned with a beatitude attitude. So the ungrateful nine represents the Jews who say that they're, they'll take everything that Jesus offers, but have no desire to worship him. The Samaritan represents the outcast who generally do believe and worship him. They could be non-Jews. But he also represents Jews who were considered outcasts like tax collectors, prostitutes, and other sinners. He represents the riffraff of Jewish society who followed Jesus. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Everyone heard the message. Everyone enjoyed the benefits of Jesus' power. Everyone basked in the light of his teachings and his miracles. But very few of them came and worshipped at his feet, glorified him as God, thanked him, and humbled themselves before him. See, most of them were takers. Only a small group of them were actually worshipers. Most of them were only interested in having him fix up their life a little bit. They were superficial and temporary. A few of them wanted him to change their souls and transform their hearts. Well, what does this mean for us? The warning is this. We can experience all the goodness and common grace that God offers the whole world. He makes the sun rise on the good and the evil. You can be blessed by God in a material way. He is the Savior of everybody in the sense that God withholds His wrath on sinners in the hope that they will come to Him one day and be saved. You can even be blessed simply by hearing those stories about Jesus. You can take what you can get. You can say, I'll take my life just the way it is. God gave it to me and I thank God for it. Your people say that all the time. They'll say, thank God I'm healthy. Thank God I have my children. Thank God I have a job. And you can still make your way right into hell. Or you can come back and fall on your face before Jesus and embrace him as the Lord and Savior. And if you'll do that, he'll perform the same miracle for you that he performed for this man. He'll forgive your sins and grant you eternal life.